So I'm going to give three lectures uh, on schools and schooling and um, give us a sense of why it is that sociologists study schools, um, what schools are, and why we look at schools in relationship to education. So I want to begin there with a core question of education and what is education um, and what is the sociology of school. So education is a process of gaining knowledge and skills. And um, with that definition of education, education is the process of gaining knowledge and skills. What I'd like you to realize, hopefully almost immediately, is that education and schooling are not the same thing. They're related to one another. They're deeply related to one another. But you can gain knowledge and skills outside of schools. Many of us do. Um, in fact, most of the education that we get in the earliest moments of our life doesn't happen in schools at all. It happens within the family. So families provide critical education. Workplaces also provide education. Um, they provide the development of skills and knowledge among the workers in order to improve the skill set of workers. Um, you can also develop skills and knowledge on your own. Um, many of you have likely sat in on the internet before and looked things up because you were curious about them. That was not a school-based process. That was an education process. It was a process whereby you developed knowledge and skills. And so you should realize that um, education happens in many different settings. Individuals can drive their own educational attainment uh, families are deeply responsible for the education of people and schools. And I'm going to focus primarily on schools uh, um, because schools are enormously important for uh, uh, shaping a society and people's lives. It's one of the critical things that almost all states do is provide some degree of schooling for people. And um, it is one of the largest organizational structures um, within any society. So in the United States, for example, there are 130,000 schools in the United States. That is a huge number of schools. And there are currently 57 million people in the United States in some kind of school. Um, we you know, have a population of just over 300 million, close to 350, but 57 million of them being within a school tells us that, you know, between, at any one time, between one-fifth and one-sixth of the population is in a school. That is a massive, massive number of people. And if we think about people's encounters with schools, even people who aren't in school have experiences with schools. So parents are not in school, but their children are in school, and their children's experiences in school have huge impacts on Sociologists of education study schooling, often asking three basic questions when thinking about schooling. The first is, how do schools recreate society? This is a perspective of social reproduction and schooling. So um, uh, this will be one theoretical framework that we'll talk about, which is to think about schools as a critical way in which societies reproduce themselves. They teach children what is valuable within that society and reaffirm the values of that society. The second question um, that we ask relative to schooling is questions of equity and fairness. Um, uh, um, uh, um, and, and so these are the second and third questions and that they're related to one another. The first is how existing inequalities affect both opportunities and achievements. So what is the relationship between social class, your class background, your economic background, between gender, race, immigration status, sexuality, other kinds of variables, and your opportunities that you have in school and your overall likely achievement? You may not think about these things as being important to schools, but if young people live in very hostile environments to themselves, then they're far less likely to be able to acquire skills within schools. 
So if you were a queer student in a very hostile school situation, even if you're very talented, um, you may not develop knowledge and skills because of the experience of that school. Here, then, we would ask about the relationship between existing inequalities in school. And that is, how do existing inequalities influence people's experience in schools? And to what degree do schools moderate or, ex or exacerbate existing social inequalities? This is related to the third question about fairness. What is it that schools do? Do they make society more or less fair? For the most part today, I'm going to focus on, and in the next few lectures on schooling, I'm going to focus on this question of schooling and stratification or schooling and inequality. When um, uh, sociologists talk about stratification, what they mean are people being classed into different groups or strata of society. So what is the hierarchy of a society? What are the different places you get slotted into over the course of your experience in any one society? So that's when we talk about stratification. That's part of what we're talking about. It's a big part of what we're talking about. But stratification and inequality are really kind of synonyms. They, they mean the same thing to most sociologists. And so I'll think today about how knowledge, skills, and schooling more generally might produce inequalities within a society. Now, um, I just wanted to show the um, incredible benefits to schooling. Um, and by benefits, just mean like what happens to you if you go to school. And here, um, you'll see what the median wages are for people who have a high school degree, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, and um, something beyond a bachelor's degree, a master's degree or higher. And what you'll note is that the difference between having an advanced college degree and graduating from high school is almost twice as much um, in your earnings. So um, uh, we see you know, a doubling of your economic advantage um, through the process of schooling. And so this um, could be thought of as schooling creating opportunities. That's one way to read this graph. The more school you have, the more economic opportunities that you have. But you could read this graph in a different way. Think about it for a moment and just look at it and ask, what else does this graph tell us? One of the things it tells us beyond opportunity is also inequality. That schools actually are associated with non-trivial inequalities in a society. Now, this is tied not just to schools, but to labor markets. Um, but you can't help but look at this graph and think, well, you know, schools actually maybe produce or help accelerate some inequalities because people who finish high school make half as much as people who have a master's degree. It's not just, however, income that schools produce. They also have increased cognitive skills. Shouldn't be surprising. That's actually the point of schools. But people who complete more schooling are also more likely to vote and be engaged in their community, and they're likely to be physically and mentally healthy. Um, so they'll have better physical and mental health. Now, again, I want you to remember some of our methodological lectures. These are correlations, they're not causes. It's not clear that schools cause better health. It could be that people with better health are more likely to have um, be able to sustain themselves through school. Um, it could be that people who are more engaged in communities are also more likely to participate in schools. Um, and it could be that other variables explain this. But at least when we look across a range of things from cognitive development to mental health to physical well being to um, uh, economic uh, uh, rewards, we see consistent benefits to education. Now, the reason someone like me is very interested in this, and I hope that someone like you will be interested in it too, is that access to schools is not the same for everyone in a society. Um, if you think about your own society, whether that's the United States or somewhere else, you might ask who has access to education and how is it that access to that education provides a range of benefits 
So in some contexts, if you live in very rural areas, you don't have the same levels of access to education as others. And so you don't enjoy some of the same benefits of education as other people do. And so looking at this also makes us think, wow, we need to think about access and opportunity as critical ways in which inequalities are produced so that if you do not have a chance to go to college, maybe because you can't afford it, then you don't have a chance at better health, better physical health, better mental health, and higher wages. And that is a process of producing inequality within a society. So before we dive into the stratification process around schooling, I want to take a step back and outline a range of theoretical perspectives on schools. This draws upon earlier lectures that I've given, um, earlier lectures that outline Durkheim and Marx, um, um, uh, primarily. Um, but these are theoretical perspectives about what it is that schools do. And I'm going to provide um, an outline of this. Uh, um, uh, first, about um, uh, uh, how it is a functionalist perspective. And then the second will be a conflict perspective. And these uh, perspectives answer the question, what do schools do for a society? How does society shape schools? And what are the most important things that happen in schools? That is, how is it that schools fit into our broader social structure? The first perspective that I want to outline is that of Durkheim. Um, it's not just Durkheim, but it's you know certainly deeply tied to Durkheim. And since I've spoken to you all about Durkheim before, I thought it's you know it's a good way for me to articulate this. Durkheim often engaged in functionalist explanations. And what a functionalist explanation is, is an explanation that says, what is the function of a thing? And how is it that we can explain the existence of a thing by that function? So I'm going to give some examples of this um, um, because it's really helpful to, to sort of see what functionalism might mean within the social sciences. First example um, actually comes from biology, not from the social sciences. And uh, in biology, there's um, often functionalist explanations that are deployed. So why is it that birds have hollow wings in their bone structure of their wings? Um, why, why do they do that? Why do they have that? Well, the answer would be so they can fly. So that the structure of the bones of birds' wings is explained by the function of those wings. So birds' bone structure is partially going to be explained by the function that that bone structure allows, flying. We can do similar things when looking at social phenomena. So um, we could ask, how is it that something in a society works? And why does it work that way? And our explanation would be by its function, by the thing that we think that it does. Another way of thinking about this is to think about society as a kind of machine. And what is it that schools do? They socialize people in that machine or for that machine. So um, they, they basically sort and socialize people into economic opportunities and into cultural and moral communities. So what is it that a school does? Like why, what, what are schools do? Well, we think about what the function of that school is. It's to teach people what the moral and normative commitments of the society are and to distribute opportunities to people to slot people into different kinds of opportunities based upon performance. So from a functionalist perspective, society is a machine and schools help keep that machine running smoothly. They're like the oil to the machine. Schools maintain social order by teaching children what they need to know in order to be functioning members of a society. 
In an earlier lecture, in a different lecture, I talked about Michel Foucault's ideas of docile bodies. And the idea of docile bodies is an idea that um, we all uh, have been trained to sit for long periods of time, in part because what is our task in the future? Well, for many of us, it's exactly that, to sit at a desk. And so our bodies have become docile objects. They're no longer built for farming in the ways in which farm bodies may be built. Instead, they're built for sitting. And if you have younger siblings or interact with younger ch children ever, you realize actually how hard it is to get somebody to sit for long periods of time. But what have schools done? They've taught you how to do that. In many ways, they've disciplined your bodies into a kind of docility, into being this kind of docile object. Here, schools are preparing you for a future life. Their function is to do that very thing, which is to make you someone capable of sitting in a chair for a long period of time staring at a screen. And schools are actually pretty good at doing that. This is a theoretical framework. It's a way of looking. It's not a pure explanation that's singularly correct, but instead a framework of understanding that's actually quite useful. I think. Durkheim, who we've heard of many times before, was especially interested in how it is that young people learn morality or the shared set of norms and values that guide their behavior. And Durkheim was interested in how it is that schools convey the moral and normative commitments of a society to children. In other words, schools tell us how we should act and what we should believe. And schools matter because when young children learn to follow the school's rules, what they're effectively learning is how to follow the um, rules of a society. And so, um, uh, learning how to follow the rules is an essential part of socialization. And this is why there's often so many fights over what happens in a school, because it's not just about what children are learning. It's also about who we are as a society, what we believe in, and um, uh, what roles are super important. And so schools do things like produce gender and our understandings of gender. They help generate our collective and shared values and ways of acting. Schools also sort people. They provide opportunities identifying students, some of whom are going to be slotted for leadership positions, others who are going to be pushed towards manual labor, some who are going to be pushed into sciences or advanced study. And schools basically help societies function by figuring out what different people should be doing with their lives and providing opportunity for children. This is a very like, you know, kind of well-oiled machine perspective or theory. Like what is it that schools do? They serve a critical socialization function. That socialization function is both to teach young people the morals and values of a society and to provide opportunities, appropriate opportunities for different kinds of kids. This is not the only way to think about schools. And in fact, um, uh, uh, another perspective has exists in, in some way in opposition to the functionalist perspective. And this is conflict theory. Um, and conflict theory really emerges out of a Marxian perspective. And their view is that societies are filled with conflict, conflict between people in different social positions, and that those conflicts are played out in schools. And so for them, schools make society less fair, or schools, in some ways similar to the functionalists, critically reproduce societies, but they reproduce societies by basically reproducing the social structure, which is to say reproducing the overall hierarchy of a society. So the schools help keep rich kids to, to, to turn into rich parents, you know, working class kids to be working class parents, and that social positions are unlikely to change. 
So the conflict theorists think about how it is that your initial social position is highly predictive of your later social position and that schools play a critical role in doing this. Conflict theories then emphasize the ways in which competition is almost never fair and that students who come in with advantages tend to leave school with even more advantages. Their advantages may even accumulate. They may get more and more of them through the process of schooling. So what do schools do? They make sure that working class kids get working class jobs. They make sure that rich kids get rich people jobs. And they help basically reproduce society in the same way that the functionalists think they do, but in terms in much more critical lens of reproducing society relative to reproducing the social structure or the social inequalities. And so um, schools help reproduce society, but not in a good way of teaching morals, or if they are teaching morals, they're teaching morals that help justify the solidification of social positions so that poor people stay poor and rich people stay rich. Now, this, both of these perspectives have some empirical support. So we see contexts where schools actually reproduce the class structure of a society. They help maintain the position of wealthy people. But we see others about how schools actually can be critical pathways of mobility and provide opportunities to some people. Now, in order to demonstrate this, I just wanted to look quickly at who goes to elite schools. Um, and this happens to be an area of research of my own, and so it's something that I, I know a lot about. Um, and here uh, um, in this graph, we see uh, um, uh, the schools Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Cal State, Friends, uh, Fresno, and Temple University. Harvard, Yale, and Stanford are elite schools, private schools, very expensive. They provide a lot of financial aid, but they still are incredibly expensive. And Cal State, Fresno, and Temple are not nearly as wealthy. And what we show here is, or we, uh, scholars show here, is um, the percentage of Harvard, Stanford, and Yale students who come from the top 1% of American family earners, the top 20%, that's the red bar, and then the bottom 20%. And what you should see very dramatically is that Harvard, Yale, and Stanford have a lot of people who come from very wealthy families. That is, you know, the top 1% of families only make up 1% of the country, and yet they make up about 19% of students at Yale, um, uh, about 16 and 15% at places like Stanford and Harvard. This means that they're nearly, you know, kind of between 15 and almost 20 times more likely to go to an elite school like Harvard, Yale, and Stanford um, than other kinds of students. That's just, if they make up 19% of the class and they only make up 1% of the population, they're 19 times more likely to go. But it's not just that they're from the top 1%. In addition, you know, almost 70% of the students at Yale are from the top 20% of family Again, that is a very dramatic number where we basically see that families who are the top 20% of American earners have children who are far, far more likely to go to um, a place like Yale. And then if you look at uh, uh, families in the bottom income level, um, that's the bottom 20%. So this is the orange bar. That bar should be 20% if they were equally likely to go to an elite school. But what we see in the case of Harvard, Yale, and Stanford is, you know, it's really closer to 2 to maybe 5%. And so poorer children are far less likely to attend elite schools. If we compare this to less elite schools, a place like Cal State Fresno, we see that almost nobody from the top 1% goes to Cal State Fresno. 
I'll say Fresno is a very good university. It just is a public university that is not considered a super elite school. And so um, what we find is that like elites tend not to go there. This is some evidence for, it's not totally compelling evidence from my perspective, but it's interesting and important evidence that shows the deep ways in which schooling is associated with um, uh, uh, stratification and inequality processes. Um, and uh, you might look at this and think about your own educational trajectory, the kinds of schools that you're currently in, the kinds of schools that you aspire to go to, and how it is that your family background influences that. And so schools are not just places wherein opportunities are afforded to some young people, but they also reflect or mirror society where elite schools are in part elite because the people who attend them are from elite families. And so looking at schooling and looking at this from a critical theory perspective or critical uh, conflict theory perspective, excuse me, from a conflict theory perspective, we kind of see how when looking at the chart there of um, Harvard, uh, Yale, and Stanford, we see a process of social reproduction that is reproducing the class structure of society. 